You're listening to The Savings Tip Jar with Dom Beattie and Harrison Asprey, powered by savings.com.au, your home of consumer finance news, guides and product comparisons. Hey, hey, it's RBA Decision Day and yes, you are listening to The Savings Tip Jar with myself, Dom Beattie and of course the one and only Harrison Asprey. And Harrison, the news is in, the RBA has decided to... Um, hold. Yes, uh, which was which will prove controversial, Dom. Um, it's great to be here once again. Um, we have a couple of guests who um, may not be the biggest fans of this hold, but for many a mortgage holder, you know they'll be wa- sweet they, relief. Yeah, they would have waited with bated breath to um, wait for this hold. And mm. uh, are we done with rate hikes? We'll, mm-hmm. uh, we'll we'll talk to the experts to find out if the RBA is done and um, if the new. Uh, RBA governor that's incoming in mid-September will change anything but yeah look um, without further ado let's just you know get straight into the news yeah and, well, and it's the big, just the RBA big, right the big news it's yeah it's <laughs> all we're talking about today is the RBA yeah so, RBA special yeah RBA is held at 4.1% and that's the second time um, and we haven't seen a rate hike since June um, mm-hmm. so that's now 12 out of 15 months that there's been a rate hike mm-hmm. so there's three months uh, if we remember back in April that there was a hold as well. So, um, yeah, what, what did you make of that, Dom? Uh, there's a bit going on in the economy at the moment. So, mm. yeah, there's a lot of things at play. Well, I'll be honest, uh, you know, every month when the RBA is deciding on rates uh, and it's, you know, it's 2.29 p.m. on the East Coast and uh, one of us in the team or a couple of us have got the RBA homepage live on their screens, <laughs> refreshing it. I know you were hitting refresh every yep. every two seconds. Control shift R. Uh, waiting for that result to come in. My heart rate definitely uh, was had, had picked up quite a bit to probably about 100 beats a minute. I need to get one of those watches that tracks it because I definitely I can feel it beating. Don't know why I'm nervous. You know, I was actually expecting a hike today, mm. uh, even though the, the the markets were pricing that the chance of a rate hike was like only like one in four, if that. Yeah. Uh, I just had a funny feeling. And, you know, you, when you see the likes of like Commonwealth Bank um, forecasting a, a rate hike and they seem to get the, the coals right quite more a often than, time, than some yeah. of the other banks, I think. Uh, I just had a feeling, you know, and obviously with the new RBA governor coming in September, mm. some people like, um, like our, actually one of our guests on this program, Warren Hogan, had sort of been in the papers saying that the, uh, the RBA, you know, Phil Lowe should uh, make it easier for, for Michelle to come in um, by, you know, doing some of the heavy lifting before she, she starts in, um, yeah. well, what, what is it, October is her first one? Mid, mid sep- yeah, October will be her first, but she yeah. comes in. Uh, so I think Phil Lowe's um, final day in the chair is um, I think 17th of September yeah um, which are, which but his last old, decision will be yeah yeah the September high school mate's RBA, birthday, so. so happy birthday yeah um, just to provide her with a you know a smooth landing uh, to come in and just you know pause 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 for you know the rest of this year good. and then mm. people will be like oh I, li- I like this lady you know keeping things steady yeah. but as we'll see um, you know some people are fired up about it so we've got Warren Hogan the uh, chief economic advisor at mm-hmm. Judo Bank and then later on we've got uh, Peter Tulip, so he's the uh, chief economist at the Centre for Independent Studies, um, ex RBA central banker as well. So he would have mm-hmm. had some inside knowledge of, you know, how the goings on of the RBA and things like mm-hmm. that. I think he was in the research department, so a little bit different, not the monetary policy, you know, committee or whatever. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, the <laughs> like people are fired up about it because they think that the RBA is curtailing these rate hikes too soon. Maybe um, even though you know we've seen in other economies. Uh, such as Canada and even the US too, their inflation has come way down from mm. like peaks of that were way higher than ours, mm. um, and they're now in like two to three percent, four percent range, which is you know it just show, goes to show that rate hikes do have their effect. Yeah, and you know as for whether this is the right decision or not, we'll leave that to the experts to you know that we've got and later on books. in the program to to talk about. But I dare say you know what the the main thing that the RBA was looking at. Uh, is obviously inflation. Mm. Um, so that that number that we saw earlier uh, last month uh, coming in at six percent was definitely cooler than than what many economists had forecast. But I think mm. they were expecting it to come down to six point two, came down to six. I think even the RBA it's, it's ahead of their forecast too. So it's coming yeah. down quicker than many expected. So I think they're probably thinking, oh, well, let's let's keep it on hold for now. There's no real reason to um, to hike. I mean, some people were pointing out that unemployment number. Uh, still remaining strong but Three then but then you know you do wonder like 
well, a, a low unemployment dump number, is that enough for the RBA to hike? Because really, I mean, what's, what's so bad about low unemployment? Well, it's, it's only really bad if it, if it means that there's high uh, inflation mm. and inflation is coming down. So, yeah, who knows? Some economists have said that, um, you know, the, the, the RBA have done enough. They should keep things on hold. But yeah, as you'll as you'll hear from some of our guests uh, later on the program, uh, some think there's there should be more heavy lifting to be done, and this could actually kick the can down the road and um, and mean yeah. we've got we're just high, inflation is going to stay higher, could get pretty messy, and um, we might even have to see more hikes sometime next year. But we won't give too much away. In, in what yeah. our guests had to say, you'll have to stay tuned to the podcast and, and to listen, listen to, to find us out. for a little bit longer. Yep. <laughs> Even though we timestamp the episodes now. <laughs> um, yeah, skip yeah, ahead, guys, yeah, if you we'll, want. We'll talk about um, home values too. So, um, as is the case, you know, at the start of every month, um, there's some new data that's come out about um, July home values from, I think, mm. CoreLogic as well as PropTrack. Um, and although house prices or home prices, I should say, continue to rise, um, the rate of growth has tempered a little bit so um, I think Sydney in particular kind of it's always the the, the kind of bellwether for the mm. rest of the country right um, the the rate of growth has definitely come off in the past couple of months and um, you know will we see a, a double dip sort of house house price falls um, who knows but that's Dom that's largely due to the um, higher level of, of listings you know anecdotally mm. I've seen a lot more investor listings um, come through just because uh, you know people are trying to like liquefy their assets and maybe they're struggling with maybe two or three mortgage payments and they're deciding just nuts too hard um and as some you know property pundits will say that there's some uh, laws that have come in in some states recently that have made it too hard to be an investor or mm-hmm. at least um not as appealing as it once was so yeah it's uh and although the rba doesn't really target you know house prices in in their decision making mm. process it's um it's, it's, a a, it's a consumption factor too like if people are feeling good about their mortgage um they have a um, higher propensity to spend mm. in other areas as well so yeah um uh, there's a bit in the data this this month yeah absolutely um so rising at 0.7 percent you know that it's actually still pretty strong uh, yeah. rate of growth i mean th- the main sort of headline is, is the fact that it's come down from 1.1 to 0.7, which is a quite a big drop considering, mm-hmm. you know, from um, May to June, it went from 1.2% to 1.1. Now it seems to have slowed down very sharply because, I mean, at a rate of 0.7% a month, that's what, like 7 or 8% per year? Yeah. Which is, um, I Just think bonkers. most homeowners would be pretty happy with that. Yeah. Um, but then you're seeing much stronger growth in, in you know, Adelaide and, and Brisbane. They're holding up over 1% which is, you know, I mean, annualizing is always such a, probably a bit of a pointless exercise when mm. you take one month's data and, and just multiply it by 12. But yeah, yeah I mean, if you're seeing, um, you know, Brisbane and Adelaide going at like 1.2%, that's over 12% growth mm. a year. So uh, that's a still fairly strong rate of growth. But uh, I think it's going to be certainly a very interesting uh, spring, sp- spring buying slash selling mm. season uh, coming up. Um, whether you know the increase in listings is enough to drive down that rate of growth maybe maybe the, the demand will lift in time for spring you know people want to get out in the nice weather and mm. there'll be a surge in people going to buy god who knows who knows which way it's going to swing but it's um yeah we just can't get away from talking about house price movements because you know it's factored in, into so much and, and so much of our economy is so reliant on the property sector what's that stat we often sort of reel off there's you know one third of people's one, jobs one, one are three somehow jobs are at least somehow tied related to, the to industry, yeah to the housing market because if you think about agents yeah you know, um, but even like lenders yeah the, the banks the financing mm. the, the all the tradies um and yeah like you said insurers uh then you got you know all those involved in the real estate industry itself you know, yep. buyers agents, Butterfly selling effects. agents, got mm. d- house designers, and, and also like a lot of our wealth is tied up in housing. So if you own a home, you know, mm. um, we've seen the ABS uh, housing and wealth stati- statistics. I should say is that the, the average punter is worth over half a million dollars. Yeah, just because yep. a lot of us own a home either outright or at least have mm-hmm. a mortgage. Um, and it's a lot lower in other countries, and, and that's also due to our pretty good super system as well, where yep. other countries don't have such a high um, or a mandatory uh, retirement income sort of program. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, Joe Blogs down the street's worth half a brick. 
Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm worth half a brick, but <laughs> we'll, we'll find yeah, that out. It is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's because, like, as I often say, you know, Australians overseas, I don't think uh, have that reputation of being, you know, really wealthy people. Mm. That's we usually reserve those assumptions for, you know, people from Luxembourg or Switzerland. Mm. You know, we think of the, the the Aussie as just the, you know, the guys living in the bush. Uh, yeah. You know, shearing sheep or with these thongs. Yeah, so, and I think you know, I think Australians ourselves are more comfortable with that image than yeah. you know the driving gold-plated vehicles and cast-up boomers driving the inflation rate. You know? yeah. yeah, but um, you know, back to the the RBA decision. I've seen you know, an economist des- describe um, this latest decision as, as a hawkish pause. So mm. if you actually read the, the line that they they say in the statement, the accompanying statement. You know, they, they do still say that some further tightening may be required to ensure that inflation returns to target. Uh, but again, that will depend upon data. And the evolving assessment of risks is the phrase that they used, which is slightly different to what they said last month. So mm. I don't know. I, I, they, they, I just think expecting there probably will be another another hike. Part of me was kind of telling me earlier this month that um, perhaps they might be done, but I'm more and more I'm starting to think, I think they've got one more left mm. in the tank. Well, that's unlike me. Um, I don't know. Like, never doubt the dove in Doctor <laughs> Phil Lowe. <laughs> like, like as soon as the cash rate uh, announcement was I do, announced, I do find it funny that you know he has the moniker "Dovish Doctor Lowe," which I'm pretty sure you coined just in, in, internally in the team. But um, yeah, you know, for someone who's supposedly a dove, who has just carried out probably the fastest tightening in, in monetary policy and. Australian economic history <laughs> it's like it's not very dovish I'd he's, say but he's flapping his wings but then um, I guess when you put that in the context of what um, central bankers in, in other countries yeah. are all doing which uh, US Fed I guess we've probably got one of the lowest um, you know you know, in sort of western economies but yeah. you know, nowhere near as low as Japan Japan who's still a still case. got a minus point I think it's like minus one or minus point one yeah. percent cash rate they're um, their inflation rate is at all time easy, was it you know, um, multi-decade highs at what three or four percent? Yeah, whoopee! Um, Which you know that that ramen's coming in cheap. Um, <laughs> and then I, I think we we discussed this in previous episodes um, when we're talking about currency. But if we look at Argentina too, their inflation rates like a hundred percent. I think their um, central bank cash rates like bloody ninety percent or something like that. So yeah, right. <laughs> it's just mental. So yeah, yeah. that's oh, could, man, could be worse. I think they're a lost cause. I think yeah. they're just going to have yeah. to give up on the Go Argentine the Argentine peso, whatever it's called. Yeah, and um, oh, I mean, I've heard they already kind of just use the, the US dollar as, as yeah. legal tender over kinda there because it's just not practical, is it? Yeah, no. It's so like gold standard, you know? No, nah, maybe not with that inflation rate. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Uh, that's that's the RBA sort of wrap, and um, mm-hmm. yeah, from from here you'll uh, listen to the lovely dulcet tones of Warren Hogan, and then later Peter Tulip. Yep, absolutely. Let's get cool. into it. So another cash rate hold from the RBA this month, which may come as sweet relief to mortgage holders around the country, but is is it only temporary relief? Uh, could we see Governor Lowe deliver another rate hike in his final month as governor? Well, let's see what Judo Bank's Chief Economic Advisor, Warren Hogan, thinks. Warren, thanks for joining us on the Savings Tip Jar. Thanks for having us on the show. Thanks for being a repeat guest and a friend of the Savings Tip Jar podcast, Warren. Um, so just straight up, what did you make of the RBA decision just then? Uh, yeah, look, it looks like the new government's finally having some influence on the RBA with the new board members coming from the union movement. We've now seen them uh, explicitly push out the return to inflation by six months to the end of 2025. If we had a know on this, of course, last week, uh, we wouldn't have forecast a cash rate increase because basically what they're saying is we're not raising rates, we're going to live with inflation for longer. That has a range of implications, not least that it's going to bring the misery to the broader community for longer. Um, People on fixed incomes who are suffering from the cost of living pressures will experience that for longer. It's also a transfer of wealth from the broader community to the government uh, through high taxation and bracket creep. But putting aside all those sorts of things, the bottom line is they leave us open to them getting it wrong on the economy. Now, most central banks at this stage of the game as we saw last week with the Fed and the ECB, some pretty serious players in our world, 
uh, take out insurance. They want to make sure they get rid of this inflation. Um, the RBA is not doing that. And of course, if the economy uh, proves resilient, and I think a rising housing market is a pretty good sign of that, um, then they're going to be in a situation where inflation could get away from them next year and they'll have no choice but to jack up rates so hard they'll put the economy into a deep, bad recession, which we didn't have to have. So it's a pretty a big, momentous day, actually. It's only been half an hour. But the more I think about it, the more we've just seen a massive strategic policy change in this country. So, Warren, as I touched on in the intro there, uh, we've still got one more month left of uh, Phil Lowe. Do you think perhaps that'll be the time for him to deliver uh, another rate hike before new Governor Michelle comes in? Yeah, look, I think he's going to be forced to because the last week's CPI was pretty good, but it's an absolute illusion. It was a one-off soft quarter. We're going to get the monthly indicator from the ABS for July, and we know on the 1 July that's the important time for price increases in this economy because it's the start of the new financial year in Australia. And we know that not only do all the administered prices that are indexed go up, and they're going to be indexed big time on the back of some high inflation in the last year, but we've known heaps of announcements that came through from the private sector, insurance companies and transport logistics, and they're just the ones that they talked about it. Most people don't tell people when they put their price up. I think we've seen the Melbourne Institute indicator yesterday was up uh, 0.8 in the month. Our Juday Bank PMIs for July picked up price increases across the whole services and manufacturing sector. They're going to see that and they're going to realise that, you know, they're just too skinny at 4.1. But it doesn't change what's happened today. Today they've changed the whole game on monetary policy, um, in my view, on the back of what was very dovish monetary policy anyway. I mean, the, uh, the Governor Lowe has just done as little as he possibly has to. He's well below what rates are in other countries overseas. So I think that you might get one more, but they're not, they're not prepared to go hard on this they're not prepared to take they're not determined to get inflation down basically they're lying to us so you mentioned that dr lowe's a little bit dovish um that's probably putting it politely um does the new incoming governor change anything given she's also had 40 years at the central bank um and especially around the rba review there's there's going to be more scrutiny a bit more transparency um arguably into the in the rba from uh, 2024 um so does that change anything yeah, it does. It does. You know, we're going to see the new monetary policy board have non-RBA people outstrip RBA people. These appointments will come directly out of Treasury uh, and therefore the government. You know, one of the first things I was ever told as an economist by my father, who was a professor before I even thought about doing economics, was all the Treasury cares about is revenue. And that's why they like inflation. They at least like it at the start until it wrecks the economy and they get no revenue. But right now, the Treasury is loving all this revenue they're getting from this inflation. And they're going to appoint these people on this sort of whole new care economy sort of mantra from Albo. And I think they're going to stuff it up personally. Um, but yeah, she won't She won't have control of monetary policy. And despite any of her instincts are to take some risk, sort of, you know, some insurance out, you might say, I don't think they'll let her. So things have changed a lot. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, people like me, it's worst fears are playing out. Some pretty strong views there, Warren. Um, let's talk about the, uh, you know, the, the so-called fixed rate, a mortgage cliff that uh, a lot of people were talking about quite a few months ago and seems to, the talk seems to have died off quite a bit. But um, I think we're kind of in the middle of that, um, you know, the, the sort of peak in the, in the wave of fixed rate mortgages expiring. Do you think to some extent that is doing some of the RBA's heavy lifting with some of those rates going from two to, you know, reverting to, you know, over 6% uh, and perhaps that's driving a sharp cut back in, in spending? Yeah, look, it is. And, and we've already seen a lot of it. As you said, we're about halfway through. Um, and I think we'll start to see spending slow a lot more in the back half of the year. But the question is whether that's enough. Um, but there is no doubt that we're going to have quite a, what you call a nominal shock. That is, interest rates have moved up so much that people's funding costs have shifted and then they're going to have to really rethink what they're doing. And some people, I think, are having to sell their property. I mean, I think we, the reason listings are so high through the winter is that people are opportunistically and very smartly taking advantage of this buoyant market to reduce the risk in their own lives. Um, when We're not going to see, though, a you know, subprime type force selling wave or anything like that emerge on the back of this is my strong feeling. And the simple reason is people have jobs. Um, I think the most important piece of data in the last month was the employment numbers, which are just unbelievably strong. You know, we've been bringing in all these people in the, this sort of catch-up phase of the um, post-pandemic immigration plans, which is great, 
but it's all happening in the space of 12 months, but then they're coming in and they're getting, all getting jobs. So I don't think we're going to see a lot of distress enter the housing market. I think we're seeing a very orderly adjustment um, and that's good, but is it going to, you know, sitting behind all this is the highest inflation in two generations, um, the tightest labor market in 50 years. Um, it just seems to me like the, the, the balance of risks is, is sort of skewed at the moment, but that's not why the Reserve Bank's reading it. So the economy will slow for sure, um, but I don't think it's going to fall over. For sure, Warren, we'll just ask you one more thing. Um, so um, you mentioned immigration coming in, you know, from now and into 2024. To, to what extent could that be kind of masking the numbers, making them look better than they are? So with you know, with regards to you know, unemployment, you said that was still uh, incredibly strong and aided by a strong uptick in employed in, in jobs and um, so on. Um, and also GDP figures as well. Um, where, like, what do you make of that? And are, are they kind of making the government look look better than what they're actually achieving? Yeah, well, I mean, they certainly give us a greater chance of avoiding a technical recession, which we know is the worst fear of the Treasurer and probably the Prime Minister. Um, but, you know, it, it does complicate the efforts to slow demand in the economy because in the end, the problem is this economy is out of equilibrium. It's out of whack. Our demand is what running above its supply. That's what's creating inflation domestically. And of course, until you get that demand and supply back into some sort of balance, you're not going to get rid of the inflation. And you run the risk, of course, that the inflation deteriorates if there's some other shock down the track. So, you know, it's, it's, it's what I, the way I describe it is it, it's increased labor supply, which should, you know, all else being equal, reduce wage risks. Wage is really racing away because you're bringing more people in. But it's no silver bullet to the problems we face. It's, it's going to add to demand in the economy. Um, the one thing that the RBA is probably relying on, in fact, the forecasts on Friday, which are updated, should show this is we can get that unemployment rate up to about four, four and a half without a lot of job losses because we've just got so many people coming into the economy. Um, but at the moment, they're coming in and they're getting jobs, which, of course, means they're going to be spending. So I think the real risk is that the economy just doesn't slow enough because of this. It um, seems to be you know, something the Reserve Bank isn't isn't concerned about. Warren Hogan, thank you so much for your time on uh, what's a very busy day for economists such as yourself. Uh, really appreciate your insights and yeah, cheers again for joining us on the Savings Tip Jar. Fantastic. Anytime, guys. Have a great Thanks, one. Thanks, Warren. Yeah, you too. So yes, that was Judo Bank's Chief Economic Advisor, Warren Hogan, there with some strong criticisms of the RBA's decision to hold rates steady this month. But now let's hear from our next expert guest, Peter Tulip, who's the Chief Economist for the Centre for Independent Studies. Peter, welcome to the Savings Tip Jar. G'day, Dominic. G'day, Harrison. G'day, Peter. Thanks for uh, appearing on what's uh, quite a monumentous day, I would argue. Um, so just first, uh, first cab off the rank, uh, super simple yet super broad. What did you make of the RBA's decision just then? So it wasn't very surprising. Um, there hasn't been a lot of news over the last month or two. You know, inflation came in a little bit weaker, a little bit lower, um, but employment was a little bit stronger. In that seems to have essentially cancelled out, and so the RBA didn't. I don't, I'd be really su- astonished if anyone was very surprised by this decision. Um, and you see that in the accompanying statement where there were no substantive changes to the wording on anything. And and mm. it doesn't look as though their forecasts have been significantly revised in one direction or the other. So overall, it's a bit of a non-event. Now, Peter, we know that you used to work at the RBA yourself. Um, and I also note that uh, you had previously actually called for uh, the RBA to carry out back-to-back 50 basis point rises. Uh, has that view of yours changed? Do you still think they, they need to go as high as 4.85? Or do you think, uh, you know, we're, we're probably near the top now? No, I think I think the, they, while I think it wasn't a surprising decision, I also think it was a disappointing decision. I think they should, I think we need higher interest rates. And the reason for that is I think the labour and housing markets are seriously overheated. The previously when we've had an unemployment rate of 3.5%, like in 2008 or the 1970s, 
that's been accompanied by rapidly accelerating prices and wages. And essentially it's got out of control and were that to happen again, the RBA would need to jam on the brakes and put us into a serious recession. So I think what I'm calling for now would be a slight increase in the unemployment rate relative to what the RBA is projecting, but that's to prevent a much larger increase in unemployment down the track. I think um, we need to aim at stabilising the unemployment rate, and it looks like a sustainable rate may be about 4.5%. I mean, who knows, but that's what past experience would suggest. Um, and the quicker we get to there, I think the more stable unemployment and inflation will be and the closer they'll be to the targets that the Reserve Bank should set for them. For sure. Now, we'll cast our eyes to September, Peter. Um, that'll be Dr. Phil Lowe's last monetary policy decision for um, as he's – you know, like in the chair as governor. Um, so what like do you think this changes things around September's monetary policy decision with the new incoming governor? Um, is will it be more much the same um, to avoid you know maybe a, a slight optics or PR disaster? Do you reckon he'll go one more to avoid the heat coming down on Michelle? It would be surprising were they to not move in the last two meetings but then do something in September. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think of what big data would come out between now and then. Um, I mean, it's Wages possible. growth, I think, is the next sort of big issue. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, But the relationship between wages and inflation is a pretty rubbery one. So mm. it, would ta- it, and it would take a very surprising increase in wages, I think, for them to substantially change their inflation forecast. Um, you know, the exchange the exchange rate, house prices, lots of things could move. There'd be there's no real reason at the moment for thinking that they'll do something dramatic that would cause for a change. I my guess is that they'll stay here until the next quarterly CPI comes out. My guess is that that's going to be a disappointing one. I mean, I I just think the RBS forecasts are, are a bit optimistic and. Sometime soon, high inflation numbers will surprise them. And when that happens, they'll raise rates. Is my guess as to how the next few months play out, but that's pretty much assuming no surprises. And, and of course, that never happens. Really what I'm saying is that positive surprises on the inflation outlook are slightly more likely than negative surprises. And by, by a positive surprise, I mean that inflation is more likely to be a bit higher than people than the RBA is expecting than to be lower. And Peter, what about the the housing market? What what uh, will this latest decision from the RBA to hold rates mean for uh, the house price movements we're seeing in the country? I mean, we saw the CoreLogic data come out today that showed uh, house price growth growth sorry has has slowed from one point one percent to a zero point seven percent. Uh, do you think this decision to hold will further stimulate maybe some more growth in the housing well, market? Well, so that's 07 in a month, isn't it? So that, that's mm-hmm. still going up faster than almost anything else in the economy. <laughs> um, and that has surprised quite a few of us, including me. Um, I had thought with these big increases in mortgage rates that that would really um, take a lot of the heat out of the housing market. But it appears to have been more than offset by these high immigration numbers we're getting and by people, uh, the desire for more floor space that's as a result of working from home. So there's a lot of strength in the housing market, both in prices and in rents. And I guess when I say strength, I'm, it's always an ambiguous word, isn't it? I'm saying that both prices and rents are going up pretty very quickly and the pause, if anything, will throw a bit more fuel on the fire that some people, I suspect, were holding off, worried that mortgage rates are going up. This gives them a bit more confidence to bid aggressively at the next auction. 
Mm. We'll move a bit more to the RBA itself now. Um, so, you know, it's not just a kind of faceless central bank. There's people, there's employees, and and you are a former employee of the of the central bank. So um, I note in your um, parting letter to colleagues released under Freedom of Information, um, you criticised um, some of the workings of the RBA. You criticised the lack of transparency within the central bank, and there's a bit of a... Um, a bit of a, a difference between monetary policy setting and then what research and what economists, you know, the, the sort of rank and file members are, are thinking and feeling. So um, I guess the the review uh, into the RBA that um, Jim Chalmers announced earlier this year or as he became treasurer um, is meant to address some of these transparency issues. Do you think what's been announced so far does much to address that or do you think there's way more to go? Oh, I think the recommendations of the review panel were very good and will go a very long way to addressing those, addressing the problems that I mentioned and that the review panel also found. Um, a lot of it will depend on the enthusiasm of the RBA leadership to put them into effect, that there are some things that, um, the government can do, and from what Jim Chalmers has said and Angus Taylor, the shadow treasurer, has agreed to, there appears to be substantial agreement in Canberra behind. I mean, th they can do some things like change the legislation, put experts in charge of the Monetary Policy Board and so on. But some of the biggest challenges relate to changing the culture of the RBA, that it's needs to be less hierarchical, more open to questions, more have more deliberation, more engagement. The uh, staff need to be invited to challenge views of the leadership. These are all things that are very difficult to enforce from outside. Mm. So Jim Chalmers has appointed Michelle Bullock, expecting her to implement some of these changes and we have to keep our fingers crossed that um, she delivers on that. Now, Peter, when it comes to, you know, getting inflation back down, um, there's two ways you can do it. Obviously there's, there's monetary policy and then there's also fiscal policy. It does seem like uh, the government has really been relying on the RBA to do a lot of the heavy lifting, which, you know, I, I'd say with the fastest rate rises uh, in, in recent history, um, suggests that that is the case. But do you think that there is, there is much more that the government could be doing? And, and if so, uh, what, what, what should they do? My view, and th this is something that macroeconomists disagree on, my personal view is that you're better off setting one instrument to one target. It's what's called the Tinbergen rule. Because if you have lots of different people all responsible for the one objective, if you've got lots of people responsible, then you've got no one responsible. And that, and the end result is buck passing. And people will say, oh, look, we've done our bit. We've tightened policy by X percentage points or Y billion dollars or whatever. Now it's up to the other guy to do their bit. And past experience in Australia and other countries is that not enough gets done and it moves too slowly. The other problem is that fiscal policy is just a bad instrument for fine tuning of the macro economy, that we're about to see tax cuts come into place that were legislated, what is it, four or five years ago? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the lags in fiscal policy are just terrible. And since they were legislated, we've thought, oh, they're much too much, they're much too weak. You know, the economy has moved up and down with cycles, granted it was a pandemic and unrepresentative, um, but the economy adjusts far more quickly than fiscal policy can. So my personal view is that fiscal policy needs to be set with long-term objectives in mind, um, such as debt stabilisation, uh, microeconomic management, income distribution and so on. That's plenty for... Canberra to worry about. We don't want to give them another thing to worry about, which is macroeconomic stabilisation, which in any case they're not very good at. It's a 
Canberra's job is to set the objectives of the central bank, and then it becomes a technical question as to how to achieve those objectives. So I guess my next question is, um, like with that in mind, Peter, has the RBA become a little bit populist? Like have they um, have they relied or been a bit more too too keenly aware of what of what the sentiment is um, felt by you know consumers? Because you know there's all this media now, you know, including us, um, and you know they, they were they were beaten in the in, in the media for supposedly saying you know no more rate rises till 2024, which you know wasn't really a promise at all. Um, and I challenge anyone to kind of na- name the previous RBA governors. Um, so what's your take on this and has this kind of influenced um, policy decisions? I think the biggest problem that the review points to is the unrepresentative nature of the RBA board, that it's a majority of them are just business leaders and they move in a narrow world and have the partic- and are ex- very exposed to the views of people in that world and there's been a concern that the broader views of society haven't te- um, been given a- as much weight. Um, if <laughs> it, It's funny, though, the remedy that the panel suggests will sound to some people as though it's going to make that um, even worse because they want a lot of monetary policy experts um, to make monetary policy decisions who will, in a sense, live in an even more unrepresentative, secluded world of their own, and and that's true. But the hope is that we'll have decisions based more on research and data, the sort of stuff that academics live in, rather than the anecdotes and stories that business leaders tend to be fond of. And there's a concern that um, without those business leaders making decisions, there'll be less exposure to the real world. The problem was that, you know, I mean, those leaders were just incredibly unrepresentative. And so you'd get the worldview of one particular business leader from one particular company. Um, I don't want to mention names um, because they all did it, would shed, you know, the experience of their particular company. And that would just be massively overweighted relative to the bank's liaison program, which in a representative, comprehensive way tries to take account of what hundreds of businesses and other people in various aspects of the economy and of society um, are telling the bank. And so the hope is that it will be, lead to much more repre- to more representative decisions. Peter Tulip, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, really appreciate your insights. Uh, and thanks so much for joining us here on the Savings Tip Jar. Yeah, thanks, Dominic. Thanks, Harrison. Thanks, Peter.